The sun set as we spoke, and the shadows growed long. Up at the main house, lamplight glowed yellow in the windows. Julie glanced toward the house, then back at me. I expect I'd better let you go, she said. It'll be supper time soon. Good to see you again, Merlin. She smiled her sad smile, turned the mare away, and rode off toward the horse barn. I watched her ride away until I lost her in the twilight. Chapter 2 I spent the next few mornings working the horses in my string and putting the finishing touches to their education. All six of them had settled down and seemed ready to work, even the sorrel Julie had called Rusty. I was looking forward to the roundup. The rough string rider still hadn't showed up. Except for the chore boy and a couple of old timers, I pretty much had the bunkhouse to myself. I hadn't seen Julie to talk to since that day at the corral, but that doesn't mean she wasn't in my thoughts. I found myself remembering her sweet, sad smile and the way her eyes captured and held mine. I recalled how her black hair shone in the sunlight and the way my name sounded when she said it. Julie was the last thing I thought about before drifting off to sleep and the first thing every morning. I began each day with the hope that I'd see her again, and I nearly had more than one serious horse wreck because my mind was on Julie instead of the Bronx. I did see her once from a distance. She was riding the hills above the ranch on her black mare, sunlight glinting off the silver conchos of her saddle. Julie sat a horse well, her back straight and her feet well forward in the stirrups, and she made a mighty pretty picture in the late afternoon light. Along about week's end, Waco and me gathered the horses from the winter range and brought them in to the big corrals at the ranch. While I manned the gate, Waco cut out the rank and salty stock that made up the rough string. I expect that Bronx stomper any day now, Waco said. He's supposed to be good, and he'd sure as hell better be. Some of these old rips eat Bronx twisters for breakfast. Two days later, just before Chuck, I was out in front of the bunkhouse waiting for the dinner bell when I saw a horseman coming up the road. He looked to be about my age and size, and he set his saddle as though he'd been born to it. His saddle horse was a blaze-faced gray, and he carried his bedroll atop a bay pack horse behind him. As I watched, the rider swung on up the road, clattered over the bridge across Little Otter Creek, and came straight toward the bunkhouse. I stood up, watching him come on, and nodded as he drew rein. The gent smiled, his teeth even and white against the darkness of his skin, and his gray eyes smiled too. Howdy, he said. I'm Billy Christmas. I'm here to ride this outfit's rough string. Know where I can find Waco Calhoun? I reached my hand up, and he bent low in the saddle to take it. Merlin Fanshawe, I said. Horse wrangler. Calhoun's been expecting you. Throw your roll on a bunk inside, and I'll help you put your horses up. 